guys know what today marks? What does today mark? No, today marks 40 days until Groundhog Day. Let me explain what I mean. My wife has a superpower. Maybe you didn't know this. She has the superpower of finding small ways to build anticipation into our family for celebrations. Recently, I just pulled my kids and to see what were their favorite holidays. I gave them all these little printouts and put little pictures on them and said, put these in the orders of your favorite, for le most favorite to least favorite. And I just want to tell you that Groundhog Day has beat out Thanksgiving, 4th of July, in my household. And the reason for that is because my wife has a superpower. They read stacks of books. They go over all of these facts about groundhogs. There's baking involved, making cupcakes that look like groundhogs, masks that look like groundhogs. It's a, it's a celebration in our household. And this is the thing I want you to think about. If that woman has the power to do that on a day dedicated to a rodent, <laughs> imagine Imagine what happens when she turns her creative, micro-making, mini superpower tradition creating efforts towards a holiday like Christmas. There is Grandma Christmas Cookie Baking Day. There is Rudolph Night. There is Buddy the L Frost Sugar Cookies Eat in the Living Room Night. There is Peppermint Candy Hide and Seek Night and Milkshake Night and Cherry Street Light Night and Cortland House Light Night and Cousin Katie's House Light Night and Juniper Lane Walk the Street Light Night, Christmas Present Shopping Week and Christmas Present Wrapping Night, 24 Days of Kindness, books stacked as high as my dog, not an exaggeration, multiple forms of Advent. It is truly, truly a sight to behold. So if you're looking to add some traditions to your family's Christmas, you can meet with my wife after service in the greeting line. But I have a confession to make. With all of that, despite all of her effort, despite the many opportunities I had to slow down and recognize that Christmas is upon us, I still found myself surprised that it's tomorrow. All this effort that my family has taken to slow down, to spend time together, to grow in anticipation this year, I have found myself more focused on other things. Despite the Advent readings and the trees and the decor, the parties that we have attended and are going to tonight, the presents wrapped, I've found that this year has been particularly hard for me to slow down. It's been hard for me to begin to anticipate what tomorrow symbolizes. I found myself distracted. I found myself distracted with to-do lists. I found myself preoccupied with work, focusing on projects going on next year in 2024. I found old that just would not shake and let go. I have found that this season has been more marked by hurry and busyness in my life than slowing down and anticipating the coming of Jesus. My kids have been counting down. They've had uh, this countdown going long before December even came around of the days when it would be Christmas Day. And every day they come to me and they tell me how many days out we are. Just one more day is gone and Christmas is almost here. But with their anticipation and their excitement, I find myself actually wishing that there were more days so that my anticipation for Christmas could grow because for some reason this year, it's gone by me too quickly. I wonder if there's some people in here that maybe you feel that too. Perhaps you felt the longing for just a few more days of this Christmas season so your anticipation could grow. Perhaps you've been busy, distracted, or hurried, and you've not given your chance, yourself a chance to slow down, to prepare your heart for what Christmas means and symbolizes. Well, you're in a good spot this morning. Today, I'd like to invite you to join me as we perhaps have the last opportunity in this Christmas season to give ourselves a chance to breathe, to pause, to welcome in a spirit of expectation and anticipation into our hearts. So would you join me and just stand as we read our guiding scripture today? We're going to be going to Luke chapter 2, and if you're a kid in this room, would you just say Luke 2? 
there are more kids than that. I don't believe you. If you're a kid in this room, would you say Luke 2? Luke 2. Amen. We're reading in verses 22. Then it was time for their purification offering as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child. So his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. The law of the Lord says, if a woman's first child is a boy, he must be dedicated to the Lord. So they offered the sacrifice in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. At that time, there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon. He was righteous and was eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The Holy Spirit was upon him, had revealed to him that he would not die until he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That day, the Spirit led him to the temple. So when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus to the Lord as the law required, Simeon was there. He took the child in his arms and he praised God, saying, Now let your servant die in peace as you have promised. I have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all people. He is the glory of your people Israel. Jesus' parents were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mary, the baby's mother, This child is destined to cause many in Israel to fall, but he will be a joy to many others. He has been sent as a sign from God, but many will oppose him. As a result, the deepest thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your very soul. If you came with a family or friend tonight, feel free to just grab their hand and allow me to just pray over you as we continue our time in worship. Father, we just thank you, God, that we could be here tonight. Thank you, Lord, for sending your son to us. Every anxious thought, every every worry on the mind, pause and go. Lord, we welcome you here. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, everyone said. You can take a seat. Thank you. I don't know about you, but Simeon's story is one that I usually just rush over and pass by. It's one that I don't usually focus on very strongly when the Christmas season comes around, but it is integral to the part, to Jesus' story of his coming and his birth. And perhaps this year, because I found myself lacking anticipation, I found that as I read through the story, the narrative, the Christmas story of Jesus' coming, the wise men and the shepherds, King Herod and Joseph and Mary, and all those things, I mean, back to Simeon and thinking about Simeon. I love how Luke writes about Simeon. In the NLT, the New Living Translation, he says, Simeon eagerly waiting for the Messiah to come and rescue Israel. The ESV says, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Simeon was an older man, eagerly waiting for the consolation to come, the comfort to come to Israel. Another way to think about those words is to put it into one word is just the word longing. Simeon was longing for something to come, waiting for something to come, relief and for comfort. And I think that we all could probably relate to that word. All of us here have superficial longings, like, I hope that the ham is cooked right. I hope that grandma enjoys her present this year. I hope that he doesn't talk too long so I can make it to my Christmas thing after this. We'll see how it goes. We all have longings on the top. Now, I guess we can relate to that. But if you slow down, and you allow yourself to experience the feeling under those shallow longings, we all feel something deeper, truer to our souls. We have one child, we have three kids, but we have one child in particular that is very, very attached to myself and my wife. A few weeks ago, we dropped the kids off at the grandma's and grandpa's house to get a night alone and to get a night away from the kids and go uh, just have a date night. That night ended up being cut short around 10.30 because that one child was crying, refused to be consoled. 
She wanted comfort, she wanted help, she wanted a hug and a kiss, but not just any hug or kiss. She didn't want any help. She was very specific. She wanted mom and dad to come and console her. And being loving parents that we are, we rushed there because we care about her. We wanted to offer the consolation that she needed. Simeon had this deep, lifelong expectation for comfort of God to come and to rescue Israel. The Advent season comes from this word. Advent's the thing that we just did right now. It's the thing that we've been doing where you see these four people, or they're not four people, families come up for the last four weeks reading small highlighting certain themes during the season. Advent comes from the word Adventus in Latin. It means the arrival or expectation or preparation for an arrival. The Advent season is this yearly reminder for us to express our longing. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. To go deeper than just the superficial things like, I hope that everything goes well. I hope that mom and dad get along. I hope that my siblings all make it on time. That deeper longing to express and to feel the things inside of us, the things that all of the Old Testament was waiting for. The old prophets spoke about a Messiah coming. It's a way for us to eagerly wait with anticipation, expectation for the consolation of Israel. It's the way for us to every year to slow down and to feel the need for something beyond what we can control. It's a way for us to say, Jesus, come. We eagerly wait for our consolation. I remember one year as a young child, uh, we had family from out of state driving hours to come and spend time with us. And I was especially eager. This family had the only other boy cousin that was my age, so I was really excited that he got to come and we got to hang out for the holidays. About an hour before they were about to, expected to arrive, I decided to go outside and wait for them to come. I crossed the boundary line between our yard and into our neighbor's yard. I climbed their tree. My siblings and my mind is our tree. It just happened to be on their side of the yard. And so I climbed that tree and I kept watch, looking for their arrival, ready to sound the alert. I don't really remember what I got preoccupied with, maybe my duties of keeping watch, tree climbing, or hiding from the neighbors. But the next thing I remember was my mother saying, Josh! What are you doing? They're here. I got so distracted with my anticipation that I completely missed them driving as far as I am here to the back of the wall, driving right past me into the parking lot, into our driveway, getting out of the car and going inside. There I was as they passed me by. I think of the story of Simeon. I think of the longing, the singular soul desire of an old man who has felt the weight of life. There's one thing left in the bucket list. Lord, help me to see the Messiah. Help me to see the consolation. Help me to receive the relief that we have been waiting for. And one day, Jesus is there. I think of the longing that Simeon felt. Not just him, but the whole nation of Israel. Generations upon generations of Hebrews waiting for a Savior to come and to relieve them, to heal them, to bring peace and hope and joy and love to them. If you would, I'd love that you would use your imagination tonight. Imagine. Imagine Simeon standing there, Mary and Joseph in front of him, and they're hold, he is holding the baby. Imagine the expression on his face. Imagine what he is feeling after years and years of waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's here. But now imagine all the people that Joseph and Mary passed on the way to the temple. Imagine all the other people at the temple offering praises and sacrifice and worship, having no idea what's happening right next to them. Imagine all of the people that walked by and never paid mind another baby, another dedication, just another sacrifice, just another normal day. Their anticipation, their hope was right. 
But it was Simeon that paused and looked and experienced Jesus. I wonder how many times I've missed that in my life. The season of Advent, the story of Simeon, reminds me to properly align my anticipation, to not let the relatives drive by, to keep focused on the one thing, the one hope, instead of pushing it off, sloughing it off to a lesser, less fulfilling hope or desire. And Advent Simeon helps me to focus and not get wrapped up on things and miss Jesus' coming. I love verse 27 and 28. It says that that day the Spirit led him to the temple, so that when Mary and Joseph came to present the baby Jesus, Simeon was there. I think about Simeon in this situation where it was just a normal day for him. There was no Christmas. There was no trees. There were no presents. There were no stories. There was nothing for him to say, this is different. It was just a normal day. Yet Simeon had expectation. He was eagerly waiting and eagerly listening for the Holy Spirit to speak to him. So one day, the Spirit led him to the temple, and when Jesus showed up, Simeon was there. He had no special knowledge that this encounter with Jesus was about to happen. Yet this story reminds me of the countless opportunities that I have to encounter Jesus on a daily basis. How many times has God wanted to bring Jesus into my day and my year, but I failed to listen to the prompting of the Holy Spirit, to slow down and to follow and to listen? How many times do I fail this year to meet God in the morning or push him aside at night? Simeon met Christ because he was obedient to the prompting, go to the temple. Simeon encountered the longing of his heart because he was quiet enough to listen to the Spirit. Simeon's story reminds me that on just a normal day, going about my normal life, that God could use that and orchestrate that to be a chance to meet with Jesus, to encounter him and invite him into my life and into my story. I'd like to show you guys, we're going to be ending here in just a little bit. Kids, are you doing good? Kids, can you turn and just give an adult a high five right now? It doesn't matter which one. If they're not looking, you can give them a little slap. That's great. Team, we can go ahead and put that. Yes, thank you. I've been getting a little bit more into art this year. Not, not a lot. I'm, I'm not uh, that savvy. But I did find this picture, and I, I want to talk about it for just a second. As I began to look and just look at pictures of art, many old, old artists, Van Gogh and Rembrandt, would paint these pictures of biblical stories. But this is not an old image. This was actually done in 2012 by a Russian artist named Andrei Shishkin. But this one spoke to me when I was looking at images. When you look at old images of Simeon and Jesus, there's usually two different kinds. One that shows the whole temple, shows people, shows Jesus, it shows his parents, shows Anna coming behind the prophetess, shows all these things. But on the other hand, the other half of the paintings look a lot like this. And this is what I want you to do if you would just focus on the picture for a second. Notice the absence of people here. This is just the moment of Simeon meeting Jesus captured. Notice the absence of the surroundings, the temple. Notice the absence of everything else going around. Notice how the artist emphasizes Simeon's moment that he realized that he holds Jesus, the consolation to his pain, his hope realized. Notice that his longing is made complete. I love how he emphasizes the emotions of Simeon here. I love for you to just take a moment and to just view this image. What have you been anticipating this Christmas season? What have you been hoping for? Is it the appropriate hope? Is it a right hope? Is it a shallow hope? 
Or is it more that deep longing of your soul that many of us like to just bury and push down and push aside? And so for just a moment, just pause. And you can pray a very simple prayer if you're not one that knows how to. It just goes like this. Holy Spirit, come speak to me. Where do you see yourself in this image? Where do you see yourself in this Christmas season? What are you anticipating? What has God promised? Are you waiting on the right thing? Right now we stop and we breathe and we feel our longing. And we receive the gift of Jesus' is coming. The story of Simeon is not welcoming baby Jesus, although it's no less than that. It's using scripture as a backdrop to understand that this is the Savior that has come, that has died, and who will come again. When we reflect on the story of Simeon and it comes to the Advent season, we too can build in our expectation. We can reflect on the things that Jesus has done. We can reflect on that he is here right now in the current struggles and trials and the seasons that you're going through. But we also anticipate Jesus' second coming. That he will come and console this world that he will come and make right every wrong, that he will come and heal and make whole, that he will come and bring everlasting peace to our war-torn, divided, ununified people. My hope tonight is that you could feel that. The invitation is here for you tonight. Some of you are here because this is just kind of a traditional kind of thing. It's like going to grandma's house for lasagna. You just do the candlelight service. Some of you are here because you've had that longing like Simeon, but life has worn you down. People have hurt you. Organizations have hurt you. Life has just ground you down, and you've displaced that hope for smaller, less fulfilling hopes. Maybe you're here, and you've just been too busy to really slow down and feel like I felt this season. No matter where you're at in your faith walk, right now, every single one of us can turn our longing towards Jesus. Hey, kids, I want you to say four more minutes. One, two, three, four more minutes. We've got four more minutes. You're doing such a good job. Church, there's an old psalm that I love to read with you and to pray with you. This is part of a collection of psalms that pilgrims would recite and say over and over again as they would make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem to worship and to find themselves in God's presence. This is Psalms 130. Would you just close your eyes and allow me to pray this over you? I will read one line and then allow you to either pray it or just listen and reflect on it in your own heart. But if you're here today and any of those things rang true in you, You're in a good spot. From the depths of despair, O Lord, I call for your help. Pause and name your longing. Name the things that you need Jesus for. Name the things that you desire and need help with. Hear my cry, O Lord. Pay attention to my prayer. Lord, if you kept a record of our Sins, oh Lord, who Lord could survive? But you offer forgiveness that we might learn to fear you. I am counting on the Lord. Yes, I am counting on him. I have put my hope in his word. There are people in here that have lost hope in Jesus. Lord, would you just restore our faith tonight? Would you grow our anticipation? Verse 6, I long for the Lord more than centuries long for the dawn. Yes, more than centuries long for the dawn. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is unfailing love. His redemption overflows. He himself will redeem Israel from every kind of sin. This is the word of the Lord. 
Amen.